Good evening to our virtual audience. Thank you so much for joining us from around the world to celebrate 50 years of Ms. the best of the pathfinding magazine that ignited a revolution. We are here tonight with Ms. executive editor, Catherine Spiller, Ms. contributor, Stephanie Dunn, and Beverly Guy Sheftal and Stacey Kett. Keltner, members of the Ms. Committee of Scholars. Tonight, we'll explore what the future of feminism and movement journalism demands of us, a vision that is bold, imaginative, and collaborative. We're especially excited to be celebrating 50 years of Ms. because Ms. has always been just one year ahead of Karis, our big sister in so many ways. Um, we have the, the anniversary of Karis's birthday, 35th birthday is celebrated in an issue of Ms. that's hanging on our wall um, with Alice Walker and Gloria Steinem on the cover. And so Ms. is in this space every day, kind of looking over us, blessing us, um, blessing the work that we do in this space. And I think for feminists of all ages, Ms. has been this touchstone. And so it's a real honor for us to get to hold up this moment and really examine all of these different threads that are gathered in this book. So I'm gonna introduce the folks we have with us tonight in a bit more depth, and then we're gonna get right into it. So as I said, Catherine Spiller is the executive director of the Feminist Majority, and she is the executive editor of Ms. Magazine. So welcome, Catherine, thank you. Thank you for all of your work. To her left is Dr. Beverly Guy Sheftal. She is the founding director of the Women's Research and Resource Center at, and Anna Julia Cooper Professor of Women's Studies at Spelman College, as well as a member of the Ms. Committee of Scholars and a Ms. contributor whose work appears in the 50 Years of Ms. collection. Next to her is Dr. Stephanie Dunn. Stephanie Dunn is a writer, filmmaker, cultural critic, and Ms. contributor with specialization in gender and race. She co-founded and chairs the Morehouse Cinema, Television, and Emerging Media Studies Department. Welcome, Stephanie. And last but not least is Steph Dr. Stephanie, excuse me, Stacy Keltner, who is a Ms. contributor and member of the Ms. Committee of Scholars, the current chair of Kennesaw State University's Radau College's Interdisciplinary Studies Department. She is also the former president of the Association for the Study of Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies in the South. So we have a beautiful and important panel ahead tonight. We're going to encourage folks who are watching virtually, if you would like to ask a question at any time please put it in the chat. And for y'all who are physically here with us, I know in a room this intimate, it may seem weird to need a microphone, but in order for everybody to be able to hear and for accessibility reasons, please raise your hand and I will bring a microphone to you so that everyone can hear. But without further ado, please put your hands together for 50 years of Ms. Magazine. Well, thank you. Thank you all. I, um, as you were making the introductions, there was a side comment over here. Cool. <laughs> we do have a very cool panel. Um, and it, it's been a hallmark of uh, the Feminist Majority Foundation's um, period of publishing this, which started in 2002, um, to recruit um, as a committee of scholars some of the leading thinkers um, uh, in feminism and to work with them to actually write for the magazine and to write for our online site. And it's it's different, obviously, than other magazines that have journalists who are trained in journalism and usually end up reporting this both sidedism um, you know, relationship to uh, issues. And uh, we decided, obviously, that was not what Ms. was or would be. And we wanted to recruit experts whose research could be reflected on the pages of the magazine but also who had special talents to convert the academic uh, language into popular media. Um, and so we've actually done a lot of uh, programs. Uh, the first uh, round of programs was supported by the Ford Foundation and we recruited and trained about 45 scholars over a three year period um, to write for popular media. And some of them um, still write for us to this day. This is one of about 36 uh, events that we put together across the country uh, to celebrate 50 years of Ms. to celebrate the book, but more urgently to bring together local feminist leaders and communities to talk about 
what we do now. Um, I mean, we, we have great uh, experience and lessons from 50 years, but what is it we do now, uh, given the backlash to uh, women's equality, um, the backlash to LGBT equality, uh, the backlash to racial justice, um, so that we can move forward uh, very strategically. And so that's, that's the purpose of these events. We've had wonderful events across the country. Each one is a little bit different different set of uh, panelists, uh, but the conversations have been very vital uh, and it's been a terrific opportunity to meet uh, people from all over the country who are doing great work in feminism. Um, so I want to get started um, and um, throw out the first qu same question um, to all three of our panelists tonight. You know, part of what Ms. has done in its 50 years is uh, often to create new language um, uh, around these issues. And one of the um, words that has carried a lot of um, uh, ideas over the 50 years uh, is was in our very first issue. It was written in an article called The Housewife's Moment of Truth. And at the end of that article, um, uh, she used the word click. And so it came to mean when you realize that it wasn't you um, who were... Uh, you know, an odd person out that it was really the system. It was institutions and the sexism within institutions um, that was impacting your life. And so it was a click moment. Um, and I'm just wondering from all three of our uh, panelists tonight, if they can remember if they had a click moment when suddenly it made sense that it wasn't them, it, it was um, society, it was the institutions around them. Um, do you want to give that a shot? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I can go first. Um, I tend to run anxious and guilty, so um, I've I I have that the that moment of clouds parting um, a lot. <laughs> I put myself in that situation just through my anxiety and guilt, um, and um, so I've had a lot of those moments, you know, in my personal life and in growing up. But um, for me, I think one of the most significant ones and coming back to what we were talking about current issues um, that are facing us today uh, was uh, realizing how conservative academia is. Um, we tend to think of it as this progressive, safe space. It's being attacked as that. And that's just not what it is. <laughs> um, when I went to, I was very idealistic, first generation college student, you know, got excited, found books, you know, um, and um, so I went to a small liberal arts school, um, you know, something like Agnes Scott, where you had a lot of attention and generosity on the part of professors. And then um, I went to grad school. It was a very, you know, small um, uh, cohort. And um, I mean, I had classes that were all women, uh, which was really weird. I was in philosophy, which is one of the widest male dominated fields um, in academia. Um, but I was at the University of Memphis, and um, it was um, devoted to um, recruiting women and scholars of color into the field. And so when I started there, there were only three black women in philosophy at the time. And by the time I graduated, there were like nine, you know, and um, they were changing the landscape of what was happening in graduate programs in philosophy across the country. Um, so it was really exciting. And I just thought this is what academia was, you know. And so I got in my first job and I'm, you know, making my arguments. Of course, this is what we're supposed to do. I have long justifications and everyone thinks I'm nuts, you know. Um, uh, and so it, it took me a while to realize where I was um, and uh, that, no, I'm not the crazy one, you know, um, but sometimes rational arguments don't work. Um, so it was really, you know, fascinating to me. So I feel like I have that over and over and over again, because I also run hopeful. <laughs> um, so I will tend to, you know, think the best of the institution that's never going to love you back. Um, so that would be sort of the biggest one for me, I think recently. Stephanie. Wow. So thank you all for being here. And I'm so glad to be back at Karis Books where I had my first book signing ever, okay. <laughs> which led to the first Ms. publication. So this is just very full circle for me. So I'm, I'm very, very happy and honored to be here. I would say I mean, there are a couple, but there, there's, there are two that really come to mind. I think one was as a breastfeeding working woman. So I, I can remember running through the airport. I was breastfeeding and it was my first business trip, if you will, to some conference while I was breastfeeding. 
literally. And I remember going, there's, there was no kind of sort of um, accommodation. There was no, it was this weird sort of feeling of like, what do I do? Because the travel isn't set up on airplanes and do you understand? <laughs> to do what I need to do really. And, you know, what am I going to say? Like I'm leaking and, you know, can I, it was just this very weird sort of thing of like, God, you know, as a, as a woman here, I am trying to work and then I'm trying to, you know, pump and it's like in the airport, but it was just ridiculous. And so that, that was really a moment that, you know, I felt very much like, wow, I am one of like millions and millions upon women who have been in the, I guess, wrong place. It's like doing the right thing, but you know, and it just doesn't make sense. It's so uncomfortable. Why is it so uncomfortable? And I'm a modern career woman. You know, what does this mean? And the other is being at Morehouse, which is, it, which is such a special place, but it is a historically black male institution. And I can remember something clicking in terms of the need to teach and to show that feminism really is for everybody. And it was when um, a situation happened in the NFL the situation was with the player Ray Rice. And there was this thing where he had gotten into, um, a, you know, a fight, brutalized the, the, his then girlfriend, I think, in an elevator or something. I walked into classroom. This is when the news had broken. And my male students, I'm the only woman in the class, were talking about it. And I'm overhearing their conversation before I called the class to order. And I'm hearing them say things like, but, you know, sometimes, you know, women, you know, they do stuff. And, you know, I'm wondering what the real story is and, you know, what happened that made him do that, et cetera. Whoa. I whipped around. <laughs> I had choice. I mean, I was so, you know, furious, but trying to, okay, this is a teachable moment. This is a teachable moment. Um, and it led to a blog piece <laughs> um, that was about, you know, battering um, that had happened when I was growing up to my aunts. I remember their black eyes and things like that. But having to challenge them and teach and retain because I was really furious. But it made me understand, like, well, they really need me to, to teach them and challenge them in this moment, not to merely just to be upset, but to question them about why would you question the brutality the that you know the of whether or not this brutality against a woman was justified under any circumstances. Yeah, what a powerful story. Uh, and I'm glad you were there. I'm glad you were there. Uh, Beverly, here oh, you have you have oh, a okay, 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 there we go. Yeah. <laughs> I, I want to just uh, say how happy I am also to be at Karis. I think I've been coming ever since Karis opened. Yes. Okay. And I see Linda that for a long yeah, for a long time. time. Uh, before I do my click, I want to say that uh, what state what uh, Stephanie just described, I have had the same experience with my black women students mm -hmm. at Spelman College, historical black college for women, when I have talked to them about the rape of our students by Morehouse men. And they have made excuses, justified it, and asked or said, why were the students over at Morehouse? What were they wearing? And so forth. So the, the, the sad thing is that even if you have been at Spelman, you might have had the same experience, which is even worse. And I won't even uh, go into that. But let me just say, I've had fewer click moments because I was raised, I didn't know it at the time, I was raised by a feminist mother. Even though I grew up in the gym and Jane Crow, I'm using Pauli Murray's phrase, Jane Crow South, I was 11 years old in the eighth grade. Normally I would have been 13. So that was the that was in the 50s. And there was obligatory home economics classes for all girls. And my mother uh, challenged the white patriarchal Memphis school system that so that I would be exempt from taking the obligatory home economics class for girls. <laughs> and 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 at 11 years old, you know, without using feminist theoretical language, she helped me to understand because I was embarrassed and did not want her to uh, you know, do anything. Uh, she made it very, very clear uh, that that was sexism and that I was college bound and I did not need to learn how to cook or sew. 
and that if ever in life, which still has not happened, <laughs> I need to learn those things, I can get a cookbook. <laughs> and 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 so so that that and and that because I was college bound, I needed to learn how to type because I would be typing papers. And so in the eighth grade at age eleven, I took typing at Memphis Public Schools, and I was so short until they had to put a uh, a telephone book so I could sit up and see the typewriter. So uh, throughout all of my life, I didn't have click because my mother had already clicked. <laughs> click. And of course her clicks were mainly initially about white supremacy and racism, but she also had what we would now call an intersectional analysis. And she also was always talking about sexism. So, before I could, so I, I, I was never stunned or surprised because she had already laid it out. Mm -hmm. I, I, I will, I'll, I'll say something else and too. You to challenge it. Yes. Yeah. The other thing is she was also very, which is very unusual, uh, uh, not homophobic and not committed to heterosexism. And so she would be very, one of her uh, best friends, I think now in retrospect, was probably, I'm gonna say lesbian because that's the term she would have said. And she would constantly say to her three girls that Aunt Gert is not married. Uh, um, she, she would say, uh, your, your aunt is voluntarily unpartnered. <laughs> she has had requests and she's not interested. And, and uh, uh, when people, uh, use the L word, that's terrible. So I grew up also uh, not being committed to a heterosexual marriage or um, heterosexism because of my mother. So I didn't have a click there either. Your mother should have been <laughs> <laughs> teaching and writing um, all along the way. Um, so in uh, putting together, I, I was one of a team of two that uh, went through 50 years of the magazine. Um, an extraordinary task, let me tell you. Uh, and actually, we did a shortcut. We went through 50 years of, of the tables of content. But that was still unbelievable. And then figuring out from that what we wanted to look at. We were very familiar, obviously, with the last 20 years of content. But that first 30 years, um, and there was so much that we uh, came across that surprised us, that delighted us, that we had not realized was in the pages of Ms. But one thing that became very clear to me is that uh, going over the 50 years, every advance, every gain this movement has made, it is because of organized effort, um, that nothing just happened along the way. There was an organized, and in a very broad sense, effort to change, um, to create more uh, equality. Um, and that you know, thinking about it also to sustain the gains, um, there has to be a real organized effort. That was one of the key lessons I took away from the last 50 years. And I'm just wondering, and this is not a quiz about the book or anything, but in thinking, and you all have been teaching uh, feminism and social justice and uh, uh, racial justice. And I'm just wondering of the, of the 50 years, um, looking back, some of the uh, a key lesson that you have taken away that um, you could share with us tonight. Um, I'll, I'll start with you, Stephanie. <laughs> I knew she was about to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I think um, there are a couple of things that come to mind. And one, I said this, I think, um, last night too, is that the coalition the coalition of human beings, and I'm not just gonna say women because there are men <laughs> who are aligned and who are committed as well, but co the coalition, Ms. started as a coalition of women, came together to start this mighty feat, right? And this has been true of the women's movement um, and the, the subcurrents to it from the beginning, that we don't operate in silos very well if we're going to really impact policy, if we are really going to upset the status quo. And right now, right now, I think, you know, the lessons of Ms., which was founded in a really, really sort of um, 
you know, a moment of turmoil, if you will, you know, coming after the 60s, the convergence of the, you know, the second wave feminist movement, the gay rights movement, um, the black rights movement, that we're at a period like that right now, right now, where we're sitting in a room where, as I said, as I tell some people all the time, I can't believe I'm sitting in a reality where Roe versus Wade is, is reversed. It's, I get shocked over and over again. Mm -hmm. So the lesson to me of Miz is that one, we have to have and be a coalition. We have to organize across differences, um, across groups, if you will, who have uh, specific missions, whether that's black rights or there's gay rights, we really need the coalition. And the other thing is that this thing is never ending. Mm. I think the, we are constantly facing backlash. Every time there's movement forward, there are five efforts or 50 to push it back. And so we are constantly must be on our guard and willing to take on in the current moment, in the current moment, like Miz did, all of this backlash. That's a, that's very astute, uh, and couldn't agree with you more. Um, Stacy, coming back to you. On that. Yeah, um, I would say, yeah, you think about that cover with the battered woman on the the cover, um, and um, all of the things that, or we have had abortions, you know, that that campaign, um, the learning to talk about and to talk about loudly and publicly. Um, things that you've been shamed for, right? Or that are um, personal um, and emotional and psychologically repressive, you know, um, and to to learn how to talk about it and to find out that it's shared and you end up creating these connections and, and that connecting um, from your little private silo um, sustains joy and movement, you know, um, really writes, writes joy into, to movement building, I think. And, and I'm very, and that was so clear looking back over the 50 years, how often Ms. was the first to do anything, um, on these issues in a very public way. Uh, you referenced that first, um, petition that was signed, uh, uh, declaring th uh, 50 famous women declaring that they had had abortions. And at the time you were admitting to haven't broken the law for the most part, uh, because abortion was uh, illegal in most of the country. Um, and the Washington Post actually a couple of years ago uh, said that that piece had really changed the course of the abortion rights movement and the reproductive rights movement because it had made visible that which had been invisible up until that time. And that was the women who had had abortions and whose lives had been improved and they were willing to speak out um, to get rid of the restrictive laws. Uh, the battered woman on, on the front cover. Um, the um, uh, term femicide uh, being popularized as a result of articles in, in Ms. Sexual harassment being on the cover. Uh, in 1977, I believe it was, you know, a good 40 years before the Me Too movement uh, re-energized uh, uh, that effort. So I, I think Ms. broke many a barrier along the way, but also was a key uh, way to take away the shame, um, uh, that which had been silenced. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's continued to, to do that. Um, uh, Beverly, any, um, any lessons? From well, years? I, I, one of the things I think um, might be not seen as much as the impact on undergraduate students of Ms. Magazine, and, and I saw that as a marriage between women's studies as a field uh, and the magazine. I, I uh, would be willing to think that many of us who ended up um, majoring in women's studies and going on to get graduate degrees in women's studies and who came back to teach in women's studies have been impacted by reading Ms. Even before the books, uh, we were reading Ms. And, and I would say Ms. in the classroom. And I can't remember when that started, but Ms. in the classroom, when, when was that? Well, um, about 15 years now, okay. 15 or 16 years. Right. right. But, but, but before Ms. in the classroom, I would say that the, 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 the assigning the readings for Ms., and young people reading Ms. Magazine, even in high school and college, had a huge impact on the way in which the field could uh, emerge. 
I think you're right. Uh, and what Beverly's uh, referring to is, is we finally put together a library uh, with uh, suggested readings. Um, and it's a digital uh, resource that's used in uh, college classrooms now uh, all across the country and some high schools, mm -hmm. some high schools. But you're right. Faculty always would take their Ms. to the copy machine yeah. um, and make copies of the articles that they wanted to assign. Um, and so we decided to, to make it a little bit more formal. Um, Beverly, I want to stick with you because there's a couple of other things I want to ask you about. Uh, you've written for Ms. Mm -hmm. um, uh, throughout um, the time that you've been involved, well, that I've I've mm -hmm. known. Um, and a couple of the key articles I wanted you to talk about. One is very recent. You wrote, History is Incomplete Without Black Women. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that was in the summer issue this 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 year, and you also did an incredible um, in memoriam uh, for Coretta Scott King. Um, do you want to talk about both of those? Yeah, and let me just say how uh, let me let me just have known uh, the King family all my life. Grew up um, oh, because my aunt was in Memphis, Tennessee. I mean, in Montgomery, and going to uh, the church as a little girl. And my cousin was very close to Coretta Scott King, so. Uh, there were things that I knew about Coretta Scott King, politically speaking, that were never uh, um, mentioned anywhere. And and I was I, I, I think I've said this to you before. I was really happy that you all asked me to write that piece because what that forced me to do is to sit down and to put um, thoughts on paper about what. I know about Coretta Scott King and enable me to get her out of the first lady of the civil rights movement widow frame and to capture her radical race, gender, and sexuality politics. And, and I say in the article that she, uh, from my vantage point, was the most progressive of the civil rights people around uh, sexuality issues. So if you all had not asked me to write that piece, uh, I would likely not have decided that I'm going to write a major scholarly article on Coretta Scott King, which I have now done. It's about 40 pages long and will appear in a collection uh, if we ever finish it. Uh, uh, and, and, and the argument that I, that, I, that I make, which some people might not like so much, is that she had a more radical vision of the beloved community. Uh, <laughs> okay, and so that's the that's the thesis. So, um, so, so I I would not have done that uh, if you all hadn't asked me to uh, write that piece. And I've been doing that talk all over the place, and people are stunned, and they come up to me and they say, "How come we didn't know these things about Coretta Scott?" So I want to just gotta say send that. that to me. You got to yeah, send I, me your article. I'll, I'll, right, I'll, right. I'll send it to you. Uh, and the 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 um, uh, uh, first piece that you mentioned. Uh, I'm, I'm on the, the board of the National Women's History Museum. And a former student, women's studies student, uh, we got to do their first exhibition uh, in DC. And it's on Black feminisms, Black feminists in DC. And so that article uh, was about uh, why it's important to include Black women's history uh, in general, but, uh, but particularly as it relates to women's movement. Mm -hmm. And not the usual um, people that we think about when we think about women's movement. So I was happy, uh, and they were really happy, the um, museum folk, that that piece that you all included that piece in there. So uh, if, 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 if you all are ever in DC at the, at the King uh, Library, the exhibition is up. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's very compelling. And mm -hmm. so, uh, so that got, uh, you know, got me uh, able to call attention to that exhibition in a place that people may not know it, which was Ms. Magazine. That's great. We love the piece. And <laughs> we love asking you to write for us because of your, um, it, your rich background, really. Um, and you've been a leader in the um, feminist uh, studies, women's studies movement um, at National Women's Studies Association uh, for very long. And um, so respected. Um, Stephanie, you also, um, we came to you after seeing your book. And um, 
tell us about the article. I, uh, the title of the article is, I thought I had, oh, in praise of badass super mamas. <laughs> and you did this sweeping look at uh, popular uh, television and film uh, from the 70s when there were a lot of badass super mamas. Um, and then um, they began to disappear really after uh, in the 21st century. Um, and maybe coming back a little bit. So can you give us yeah, sure. Give us sort of an overview. Of yeah, that. so that was really exciting because um, the book was Bad Bitches and Sassy Supermamas by Power Action Films, which was looking at the representation of race and gender in the so-called um, films associated with the black exploitation genre. But also, you know, there I did a you know conversation and a, a deep look into the word bitch and the way that feminists had flipped that word. Right. In the late 60s and early 70s, it was a bitch manifesto. And, you know, the whole so I discussed these things in the book and Ms. Um, I think received a copy of the book. And I was, you know, just, you know, we thought I had won the lottery or something mm -hmm. um, when there was, would you write an article? And I was like for Ms. Magazine. And so, <laughs> I mean, it was literally one of the most exciting publications to this day in my entire life. I was I could not believe I would be in the company. And what was so interesting is that Ms. had been such a source of research for the book because one of the um, pieces that I drew from was an interview with Pam Greer by Jamaica Kincaid, oh. right? Which had occurred in 73, 74, where um, they have a conversation about the narrow scope of black women in Hollywood on screen and about her persona. You know, she was sort of, you know, it, this, this, this sex goddess, if you will, that, was you know really beautiful on screen and coffee and Foxy Brown. And she said in that article to Jamaica Kincaid that she wanted to do different kinds of roles. She wanted to, she tried to push for a different representation, the stress beyond that. But she said, and I'm quoting so so no one get offended, but she said that AIP at the time just wanted to keep doing tits and ass, tits and ass. And so this is me quoting Pam Gray at the time in the Jamaica Kincaid piece. So to come back to that in my piece, which was looking at a really watershed moment in the early 70s was a very interesting time when you talk about women, generally police woman, Angie Dickinson, that was get Christy Love, right? Um, and then there was this rare presence of Cleopatra Jones played by Tamara Dobson. And then also, of course, Pam Greer, who was Coffee and Foxy Brown, entering into this space that black the Black Power Movement and the feminist movement has sort of, you know, shaken um, in terms of the demand for more empowered superheroes, if you will, on screen. So we were in this sort of moment where Sidney Poitier had been the dominant sort of black Hollywood presence, if you will, on screen. And then there was this sort of, you know, pushback, you know, to want sort of like the, I guess, the, the fiery, um, uh, rebellious hero on screen. And so I was looking at the limitations of that, but also the radical implications and possibilities of that role. And they never die, do they? <laughs> we keep coming, we keep coming back. There's a reason why, you know, for the remakes of not only Shafts, but the reason why people like Beyonce and later the rapper Foxy Brown channel, you know, and keep channeling. The why the reason why even Quentin Tarantino, right? <laughs> you know, it's at this Pam Greer, you know, fix and so there's all kinds of you know things because you see the legacy of that in Kill Bill films like Kill Bill, problematic, not a feminist <laughs> series conversation for later, but you see the influence of that period all the time with the ways that black women, badass or white women or others on screen, there are remnants of that period that shape who these superheroes are even now. It was a great article, very popular. Um, so I want to ask about the attack now on women and gender studies and on black studies and what is happening, not only in Florida, which we read about all the time, but right here in Georgia. Um, so Stacey, I'd like to start with you in terms of what's happening that you, and you're at a state school. Uh, so you're seeing it firsthand and, and commentary from all of you about I mean, it's obvious why, uh, but what are we going to do about it too? Sure. So um, this is something that hasn't, you know, been in the news um, as much, but the Board of Regents um, of the University System of Georgia 
um, essentially was able to turn Georgia University Systems into Florida overnight. And it was very quiet. Um, I found out about it the very first week of when we met, um, when they bring all of like, you know, the chairs and AVPs and deans together for their leadership week. And then all of a sudden there's all this culture of control and compliance. <laughs> this is <laughs> this is our leadership week. Um, and there was, you know, we had this presentation on these new BOR policies that um, had to go into effect by September 1. And this was August. Um, and the way they did it was to actually draw on the American Association of University Professors commitment to academic freedom. So they strengthened all of the, um, uh, you know, claims and rights about academic freedom. Uh, but then they had this one little clause in there um, that you could not require um, any kind of attestation or oath um, of loyalty to anything um, that, um, except for the George, the oath, the, the oath of the loyal, o loyalty oath to George, that one stayed in parentheses. <laughs> they were gonna keep that one um, that we have to sign when, when we're employed. Um, and and this worked because they connected it to hiring. So when you're hiring, you cannot ask um, a potential employee what their views on diversity are or what they think about coming to a campus that is diverse, um, because that would be considered asking for a, a political statement or a political affiliation. And so because of that, it has trickled into questions about mission statements, vision statements, um, diversity statements. Our diversity office was re renamed something like innovative excellence. Like that's the thing now. Everything's become innovative excellence, right? <laughs> to get around it. Um, and so overnight. excellence before. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's right. Um, so I'm in interdisciplinary studies and, and it's a department that houses all of the programs that end with studies you know, and has social justice um, uh, intent. Um, so we have gender studies and black studies, peace and justice studies, American studies, all, you know, um, all, all of these. And um, it's all, it, the university has always been problematic, has always been very conservative. Um, but um, this has created a, a real chilling effect. And for a while we were told, you know, if you have a statement on diversity in your syllabus, um, should you take it out? Should legal look at it? You know, how are you going to manage this? You need to make sure that you tell students that this is a personal statement on diversity. Um, and it's not germane to the field. Um, but, you know, what's, you know, interesting about that too, the way in which it's, it's being talked about by upper administration, um, who is no longer, you know, uh, committed to liberal arts values and critical thinking, I think. Um, it's more control and compliance. Um, when when we have sort of stressed that, you know, these issues are germane to our field and we can't represent all perspectives in a 4,000 level class on Black feminist thought, for example. Um, and, and their response to that is, that's an extreme example. But for us, that, that extreme is like the heart of you know, critical thinking and interdisciplinary work. Um, so that BOR policy um, has, you know, created a kind of chilling effect and um, a real concern about, you know, in, in the classroom, uh, what you can say and what you can't say. Um, and not knowing who's in your classroom or why they're taking your classes, because we've had issues uh, with that too, with, um, men's rights activists, for example, or um, anti-Black racists, for example, uh, targeting faculty and doxing them. It's become very, you know, quite hostile. And I was at a chairs conference last weekend, um, and we were talking about how hard it is to recruit faculty to Georgia. Um, and people, were, people said, yeah, well, you know, everyone has their list of states they want to apply to. You know, and Georgia is now one of them because faculty are looking at the impact that it's having. So there's a lot of work to do. Yeah. And Florida, of course, has seen the extreme of all mm -hmm. this uh, with the defunding of um, women and gender studies programs and attack on uh, black studies. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we've got to figure out how we're going to fight back because it's clear that this is part of of the backlash. Um, mm -hmm. And so strategies for fighting back. Um, Beverly, um, you're, here, you, you got to use oh. your mic. 
first thing I think we really have to, we, we're in very dangerous fascist uh, uh, moments. So this is, this is and, and I get into arguments with people when they say we've been here before. We haven't quite been here before. The, the, the uh, banning of books, the firing librarians if they order. I mean, this is, this is, this is for me a very uh, scary and dangerous times. And I think that, that we need to, first of all, make that very clear. Because, because it's very easy to just say, oh, we've been here. Um, this won't last very long. And, and I think we need to understand why it's happening. And one of the, you know, getting back to men's and getting back to women's studies and black studies, the, the, the right wing is very aware that, that uh, these discourses and this history has impacted young folk. <laughs> and not just young black folk, but young white folk. You know, when, 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 when a, a lot of young white people were marching against police brutality and they asked those people why were they doing it, they talked about college classes that they took, women's studies, black studies. And I would say reading things like me. So we've, we've, I think, first of all, we have to make, we have to help people understand this moment before we have strategies. And I, I think that the strat, the, we need to be sitting somewhere in carefully crafted spaces and, 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 and to try to figure out what to do because it is really daunting. And uh, especially if you're in a public university as opposed to a private. It's, it's very different. And if you're in certain states. And I don't know that we have the answer. You know, Ms. is trying to, to help provide the space. Uh, we, uh, our summer issue, the cover was banned, and we were uh, interviewing uh, faculty out of Florida in terms of what was happening there and looking at uh, across the country. We started a series on the website, um, and it's uh, reports from the field um, to, to try and engage in an ongoing conversation. Um, and, you know, we need you to be writing um, some of this uh, for the website so that hopefully we can help spread this uh, and sound the alarm. I, I agree with you. Um, people don't, I don't believe, uh, people typically understand what is happening in this country. And you're right too that women and gender studies programs, black studies have been, and uh, feminist bookstores, uh, Karis, have been just a critical component of spreading the ideas. Uh, and Ms. has been part of that, um, spreading the ideas of this movement, which are its strength. Uh, we also have been key in, keen in uh, ringing the bell of alarm uh, when necessary. And this is a time. This is a time. Um, Stephanie, any? So, I mean, I totally agree. I mean, it, the word insidious comes to mind. Most people, I don't think, read or research, even though we have our, our information with the tap of our finger. If you go to your states and other states um, into the, the legislative um, policies and you read it, you I, I guarantee you, it will make the hair stand up on the back of your neck. Because you will read things like well, about how, well, if this makes people uncomfortable, you'll okay. see it in writing. Then you can't teach that. It's different from hearing the tidbits on the news. Yeah. So people really need to be, uh, I think they need to be reading and have, we need to have this policy on the X or Twitter, or whatever mm -hmm. you're calling it for our states. It needs to be something that is accessible because people don't necessarily go and find it. Oh, let me read what Georgia is saying about books and about the curriculum and what you can't, they're not really seeing that, right? So we need to be distributing that. We need to be looking at what is happening in between elections so that people understand that the decisions that are bothering, you know, right, district lines and that are putting people on school boards, much of that work is happening in between these big elections that we pay attention to, like the presidential election. I think that people somewhat know this from a distance, but they're not, it's not translating enough on the ground so that parents understand it doesn't matter if you are in the poorest neighborhood or the richest, the decisions that are being made on the local, the state, and the national level when you're not looking, right? This is why your child doesn't know about X. This is why your child doesn't know this. This is why you don't even know this book is banned that you yourself read. You don't, you read Judy Bloom 
you know, and you think, are you there, God? It's me, Margaret, and you don't know that your child can't read this book now, right? Um, because it has the word period in it or something. You So right now, I think it is very important not to just be into the spaces, but I think that we have got to master this digital social media u universe and we have got to exploit the hell out of it to educate folks within the capsules that, that they need it, but we have to do it to mobilize them on a different level. That's also very new, right? right. It, yeah. It's because the right is using it to great effect. And so we need to master that digital component that connects us to younger generation. It connects us to people in the middle, baby boomers. We got to master that. And we have to do literally a digital movement. Well, think of Ms. when you think of digital movements, because um, not only do we continue to publish the magazine uh, in print four times a year, uh, but we have a very vibrant website. We publish upwards of 125 to 150 articles a month uh, on the website. We, we reach about 5 million people um, on an annual basis. Uh, we also are now podcasting. Uh, Michelle Goodwin, a uh, uh, law professor at Georgetown, uh, is the uh, executive producer at Ms. Studios. And we've got some wonderful podcasts. We, In fact, uh, one of the series that we want to start in the new year is uh, a series on books that have been banned. So it would be short little interviews with some of the authors who have been banned. Uh, because I agree with you, I don't think people understand the extent of the attacks right now. Um, and you know, we've just got to, uh, and people are opposed. I mean, public opinion is opposed to banning of books and, uh, you know, closing down of women and gender studies programs. But I think they don't understand uh, the extent of it or how it fits with this whole rise of authoritarianism in our own country uh, and, and globally. Um, so any, any contributions that you all want to make to this dialogue on Ms., we want you there. Uh, I volunteered very much. myself. Okay, there you are. There you are. Yeah. Did you want to? Yeah, I was. I was going to say one more thing. They um, just coming back to the university and the way it's being um, represented as this, you know, safe progressive space <laughs> that it is not. <laughs> I mean, it's like you know, um, funding for diversity initiatives is like literally like point one percent or something, um, something abysmal like that. Um, and um, needing to um, educate students because, I mean, faculty can complain all they want. No one cares about faculty, but students need to know. And so during National Banned Book Week, I was really surprised at how little new students knew about banned books. And we had, you know, buttons like bans off our bodies, books and ballots, you know, to sort of widen the conversation. But I had this, um, I have this colleague um, in gender studies and English who put on this, she's a book collector. I mean, she has the most amazing books. Um, and she has this huge library of banned books. And she created a showcase um, so that you had to walk through all the graphic novels, all the, um, and students came in and they're like, that's banned? I read that book. Why is that banned? why was it banned? When was it banned? And so all of a sudden they had, you know, these questions about it. And then they would ask about, um, you know, bodies and ballots and what's happening um, because they, they don't know. And it's, it was shocking to me, really. There was a click moment. <laughs> what's going on? <laughs> what are they doing? Um, so I think really, you know, having students rally to um, protect the values of uh, liberal education. And essential. I think also to your point, most students, we, the right is good at making something really popular that has no meaning in it. So, so they, so they can take something like woke culture, right? And people don't know, even know what the hell that means, but, it's bad. but they're like, it's bad, right? It's like socialism, it's bad. And so they, and so they just started, you know, throwing it around this demonization of critical race theory, which I, I could when I when I talk to a student or just an average person, they don't even know what the hell that means. It's like it's bad. They don't know. They haven't read the scholarship. They don't understand the the legal, political, historical implications. But they were so successful in dirtying it up, right? A field of study 
that had been instrumental. And so I think that this this is back to that point that this is not just do K through 12 anymore, right? This is this is on the college level and ignorance it really is our enemy. That our students don't know what what that is, that they don't understand that the banned books movement is not just some sort of fancy tag that this is actually real political power, the social power being exercised and that when they don't know who, you know, Kimberly Kinshaw or, you know, you know, all of these people are, they're they're more susceptible to sort of being fed, right? This line of like this woke thing is bad. It's like, what does that really mean? When I ask, what does that mean to be woke? And they're fumbling around. And, well, it means you like mean what? What does it mean? <laughs> well, the pushback that happened on the AP African American um, course mm -hmm. uh, had some success, and get I think Kimberly Crenshaw's name now appears twice. And, and in the revision. Right, in the revision. Um, uh, it's it's a long way from what it should have been, but it shows um, the susceptibility of our system of education to these kinds of orchestrated efforts um, to uh, get rid of uh, what has advanced our movement in so many ways. Um, so big picture, and then we're going to open it up for some uh, questions, is, you know, we're at this critical moment. We really are. Um, and um, it, what is it that we could do um, to, to move forward, to push back against the backlash, uh, but also move forward? Is, is there one thing, and of course there's not one thing, but there's one thing that any of you want to bring up um, as really important and critical uh, strategy for how we keep moving forward even in this period? One thing I want to say. Okay, you got to use your mic. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. One thing I want to say, we've got to get people out to vote. Yeah. Uh, I, I cannot tell you how many spaces that I go into and they say they're not voting. They're sick of the uh, Democratic Party. They're sick of Biden. They're sick of everything, and they're just not going to vote. I, I would say that this is one of the most important elections. Yes. Yes. And we have got, so that's just why we've got to get people to the polls, y'all. And we got to get young people to uh be get over it yeah just get over that's it. right yeah and, and to get over yeah. it and i mean i say this this is terrible and i'm sorry okay i would vote for my dead cat <laughs> uh, 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 rather than the other side okay so that's just we gotta get we gotta get people out to vote i was just i was literally about to say vote but not just vote we have to really do a better job on the ground to the people who are saying, I don't, I, you know, I don't want to, you know, vote because, you know, I don't like anybody that's running. The the level of the conversation, their explanation around that is troubling yeah. because they really seem to be disconnected from what this is going to mean in terms of policies, what is going to be lost, that this has to do with who's on the Supreme Court, even though it, we we think those of us who are, you know, presume ourselves to be educated or to be voters. I think there's a presumption that, you know, the folk out there are the vote. Don't they hear it enough on the news or something? But I'm telling you, it is not happening. And I think part of it is because we're in such a personality cult culture. The, the, you know, it's the politics of personality. And so folks are, you know, so busy at times waiting for a personality to attach to that they're not attaching to policies like you think. They're just doing lip service to whoever the personality is who's spouting it. And this is a really a big problem. Well, and who's ever planted this uh, drumbeat now that uh, you should be upset with both sides, both parties. Right. And so what difference does voting right. make? But I mean, this is being repeated over and over and over again in the polling. You know, the pollsters are now asking the question, well, why aren't you going to vote? Uh, why should we be, this has been an orchestrated effort to depress the vote. Uh, absolutely. And this state is a very critical state in the next election. It is a battleground state uh, in the presidential. Uh, and and we've just got to make sure that people understand what is at stake. I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, voting is, is really critical. One thing that, you know, we've done at Kennesaw is um, we always get people trained to do voter registration um, and to get that out. And I know Ms. is talking about how to, how to deliver on campuses. Um, so I think that's critical to have point people on all of the campuses to get students registered um, and to get students to understand how and where they can vote. Because I think there's confusion about 
how and where I can vote, where is my ballot, especially if they're out of state. Um, and so having all of that clarified for students, making it easy, um, I think would be really helpful as well. Exactly. In fact, students are told if they're coming from out of state, well, you know, you can't vote here. Well, you know, there's a Supreme Court decision that says you can. You get to register and vote wherever you are in school. Uh, it's, a, it's a constitutional right. Uh, and yet students are, are frequently discouraged from doing so. And there's uh, a, that documentary on, on Stacey Abrams mm -hmm. and the way the election was stolen. Um, I showed that every election season so they understand um, what gerrymandering is and, and how it works and how an election can be stolen. Um, that's been really important in terms of educating students um, as well. Very critical. So do we have any questions um, or comments. from, yes, or comments? I'll subscribe. <laughs> yeah, please. That's what this is supposed to be about is, is a conversation for how we're going to, how we're going to keep moving forward at this time. And are we taking them from online as well? Or? Yes. We are taking them from online, but I was going to let our in-person folks go first. Yeah, let me bring this to you. I'm Millie Coleman. My undergraduate degree is home economics and food studies. <clears throat> My master's degree is in women's studies, looking at how home economists were forward in fighting male domineering when women couldn't go into business or restaurants the home economics movement made a place for them they taught chemistry through foods they taught um, time management through the equipment courses and the backlash came after world war ii when women were taken out of the colleges and out of everywhere and told, put on their aprons and go back to the kitchen. And I'm so sorry that was the backlash that you faced um, with home economics. The teachers they hired were not feminist. They were not encouraged to make their students uh, go into business. And the women who had done that earlier were all retiring. So, um, and at the same time, when the Civil Rights Act passed, it said that women can now go to any restaurant. Prior to that, they could be forbidden to go to a restaurant. And all the tea rooms closed, which were the feminist restaurants, unlike British tea that we think of today. And the black restaurants closed because they could then go to the white restaurants too. And I believe that we have missed a lot of that education that women today don't realize the pathways that were made so they can eat out and can go into business and can take typing today. Yeah, no, the problem, my mother had a problem with the fact that this was required for all girls. Right. That was the, that was the issue for her. Yes. Okay, right. Yep. And, and boys got to take, boys, boys got to take, boys got to take, right, right, yeah, that was, right. yeah, she did, she, that it was the obligatory, uh, girls take home ec, boys take shop. Take shop. Right, right. And that was because the feminist women who had started the home ec programs had lost their power after did, World War II. That I did not two. know. That I did not know. Was, did I see a hand over here? This, uh, interesting. I just, just oh, sort of sorry. comment on that. If you look at sort of the, um, feminist histories of science, this is one of the moments they go back to that this was one of the only spaces that that women scientists could actually operate in and what they had done in order to develop a whole um, history of, of um, feminist uh, and how they were able to move out of home economics and into other fields um, because of the work that was done there. Yeah. Any question? Do you have a sort of iconic um, article or piece from each decade as you were putting this book together or thinking about this book? Was there, did you think about it in terms of this is the piece that defines the 70s? This is the piece, was it, I know that's overly simplistic, but. I had that question too. <laughs> there was no one piece. In fact, the, the story that I've been telling everybody is, uh, you know, after going through all of this, we uh, had called out 
a series of articles for each uh, decade. And we had to actually edit each article because some of the original articles were 3,000 words or 4,000 words. And we were looking for uh, how we would reduce each piece to about 1,500 words at most. Um, and so we had painstakingly selected articles and had edited them down and had uh, looked over the entire collection to see how issues had played out in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s and so forth and uh, shipped off the manuscript, um, having, uh, you know, many a sleepless night to, to put it all together. Um, and our editor at Kanab, um called me the next day and said, uh, I'm thrilled you got the manuscript in on time. In fact, you're a little bit early. Um, but I have to tell you, without even reading it, you have to cut it in half. Yes. And, yes. And <laughs> that is when Stephanie's article, which is a, a favorite of mine, got on the cutting room floor, as we say. Uh, and, and I'm sorry, Stephanie. I'm gonna I still it. love Miss. I'm going to print it and put it in my copy. <laughs> So it was, uh, no, it was, it was really impossible, uh, just impossible. But um, as I said, we, we, we could see over the 50 years how issues played out, how uh, strategies were playing out, how consciousness was being changed and, and, um, and the increase in power uh, for, for feminists over that period. And yet here we are uh, facing, uh, we don't have equal representation and decision-making when Alito, uh, you know, wrote the Dobbs decision and said, this goes back to the people to decide to the people. Um, you know, the state of Alabama, I, I think there's maybe 12% uh, women in their state legislature and, uh, Texas and, and I could, you know, go on. Uh, that's not the people. Um, and in fact, when it does go back to the people, what we've seen every single time is that, the abortion rights uh, view wins. Uh, we just had another big victory in Ohio, huge victory. And the Republicans there are now trying to say that the courts cannot interpret the new constitutional amendment. So they're now changing the laws on what the uh, Georgia uh, courts can and cannot do. Um, this is how determined our opposition is. Um, uh, uh, so none of us should be shocked when we see this play out. Kathy, before you move on, though, what about the, because um, this is another culture of its own, really, the Ms. Magazine uh, covers. For me, those are really, really, really special. And two of my favorite, of course, are, are is the unbought, you know, unbossed one that teaches Shirley Chisholm and Gloria Steinman. And probably the other one is the uh, Gloria Steinman and Dorothy uh, Fitzhugh's uh, fist race. But what about for you? And Because I know it's got to be, though, you love all the covers, but, you know, I mean, really. <laughs> <laughs> Again, very difficult, but uh, one cover, uh, some covers I'm very uh, proud of. You know, the very first cover, the very first issue of Ms. was an insert in New York Magazine, uh, and then it hit the newsstands. Uh, that cover in New York Magazine was the multi-armed woman who was juggling every aspect of life that women juggle. Um, uh, in the home, outside the home, uh, and everything in between. And we decided coming out of the pandemic, um, so it was uh, 2021, when the pandemic had laid bare the reality uh, that this economy depends on women um, to function, and it was the lack of child care, the lack of elder care facilities um, that had suffered terribly during the pandemic, and, and the big questions were, how were we going to come out of it now? And women then go back into the, or go back into the physical paid workforce. Uh, and so we decided to repurpose that cover. And of course, uh, childcare funding, uh, the care network funding as a whole was getting cut out of all of the bills that Congress was fighting over. The first thing to get on to be cut, of course, was the, that funding. Um, and so we repurposed that cover. Uh, it was a black woman. Uh, it was an artist renditioning, a, a black woman on the cover who had one child in her arms, another child on the floor, uh, a computer in one hand. Um, you know, it, it essentially it, it, it was a multi-armed woman again. And Instead of the headline, which was the 1972 article, uh, the housewife's moment of truth, which was the major click article at the time, we re, um, our new headline was the nation's moment of truth mm -hmm. and do we care? And uh, we had some excellent articles in there about um, 
the economy and, and obviously the role of women, but also the lack of this care uh, infrastructure uh, that's holding us back as, a, as, a, as an economy. Um, th those are two of my favorite covers, but all along the way. I mean, um, and, you know, so it's um, so do you have any favorite covers? I, like, I, I don't know. You have to I use your mic. I, I but, you know, one thing I have to say, as uh, his, historically speaking, women of color put pressure on Ms. Yeah. to uh, not have those covers be all white. Right. OK, so we and, and Alice Walker, who was working at Ms. was one of them. Mm -hmm. So we have mm -hmm. to put that in the in, in the history. Mm -hmm. OK. Mm -hmm. And and of course, that's predictable. And that's part of the women's studies and women's movement. So, yeah, so that and in was, fact, um, uh, that was during those early years. Exactly. And Gloria had been told by the um, industry that uh, has the newsstands and that distributes the magazines that if they put a black woman on the cover, right. uh, the newsstands wouldn't sell it. And in fact, most of the newsstands in the South um, canceled uh, carrying Ms. Magazine as a result. Right. But so we they did it. it. Yes, they, they did but they it. did it. Exactly. And they also told her, uh, you know, you can't you can't publish any articles about lesbians, yep. she said. And so, of course, we did. Uh, uh, so, I mean, I, yes, um, uh, the, the movement played out in those uh, offices of Ms. in so many ways. But I think I'm, uh, I'm proud that Ms. hung in there in, in many ways. And a lot mm -hmm. of it was because of uh, scholars like mm -hmm. yourself, uh, Bonnie Thornton mm -hmm. Dill, uh, and others who, uh, Alice Walker, mm -hmm. of course. Um, and most people don't know that Alice worked with you. Yes. Yes. And, and, and let me just say, too, that was also part of the, part of the reason that Alice was attacked so much uh, for the color purple is because she was associated with white feminism. Mm, okay? Absolutely. And that's something that and, and, and their 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 so-called evidence was the fact that she worked with this. Just, just think about it. Where, where would they where, where in the world would that come from? And so but a lot of people don't know that that that, that you know, Alice was struggling and worked at Miss. Yeah. <laughs> and the archives at uh, Smith, um, Gloria uh, uh, Steinem donated the first 15 years mm -hmm. uh, of her, um, because after 15 years, they sold it off to one of the commercial publishers. But Smith contains all the archives. And there's all of these letters between Alice mm -hmm. and the staff of Ms. Uh, back and forth. Yeah. And they were very, very close. Um, mm -hmm. And even, you know, where where can she find childcare right. when she had moved? I mean, it was just, I wish we could have published all of those. Yeah. Um, it's an amazing collection. We find it curious that, you know, what is old is new again all the time. And so, you know, there's, we have, you know, 18 year olds who come in and are interested in ecofeminism and are interested in movements that are very popular in the seventies. Now they're, they're putting a new twist on it and things like that. And I was just listening to a podcast the other day and somebody referenced as if it was brand new Judy Sire's I want a wife as like, everybody should li go listen to this. Cause it's still true. Um, which I think is what, you know, in thinking about the cover that you were just mentioning, I think, you know, how does it feel to you um, all to be sort of in this moment of we're, we're just reinventing these same struggles. And, you know, when you, when you speak to younger feminists, mm -hmm. college age feminists who are just kind of putting their mark on things as young adults um, and, you know, they are finding, they're grasping at tools and they are going back to older texts and they are finding them helpful, which is, I think, a hopeful thing. But there is so much relevance because so many because of this retrograde moment that we are in. Are there things that you um, would want to point to for them within the pages of Ms. or in other places for them to sort of be like, you know, the thing that I think a contemporary feminist might want to go find is X or I hope they would find this in the pages of Ms. Well, I, it's one of my favorite subjects to talk about. And Ms., uh, the Equal Rights Amendment. Ms. has covered the Equal Rights Amendment from the days that it was being debated in Congress and was voted out of Congress in 1972. Uh, and throughout the entire 50 years um, that we have been fighting to get uh, the Equal Rights Amendment in the Constitution. Um, and so just a very quick, um, in fact, the Equal Rights Amendment has been ratified. Uh, it got the, the U.S. Constitution only requires two things to add an amendment. Uh, you have to get a two-thirds vote, a supermajority vote in both houses of the United States Congress, in the Senate and the House. That happened in 1972. Uh, and then the second thing you have to achieve is that 
three quarters of the state legislatures have to vote to ratify a new amendment. Um, and that happened in January of 2020, led by black women in the state legislature in Virginia uh, that had flipped from the 2019 elections uh, as a result of the work there. Um, so in 2020, uh, the 38th state, uh, Virginia, voted to ratify. What happened next was the Trump administration's Justice Department stepped in and said, you can't publish it to the archivist who's responsible for literally the ministerial role of publishing a new amendment and adding it to the Constitution. It would have been the 28th Amendment. The reason they could get away with that is that in the preamble of the ERA is a seven-year time limit. And it's, it's in the preamble. It's not in the text of the Equal Rights Amendment that will be added to the Constitution. And every major constitutional law scholar that we consulted has said that it's not binding. Um, and Congress could change that. And in fact, Congress did change it once. In 1978, uh, when the seven-year time limit was fast approaching, they extended it. Uh, but they only extended it to 1982. And so they need to extend it again. And they can do that which is the same thing that Congress had to do to get the 14th Amendment into the Constitution. Because between the last state ratifying the 14th Amendment and before it was published in the Constitution, two other states rescinded. Um, and in fact, there have been five states that have rescinded their vote on the ERA. Well, the other great news is that you cannot rescind. Yeah. The, the Constitution does not provide for rescissions. Um, and so, uh, but the 14th Amendment was only added to the Constitution because Congress uh, voted on a resolution that said it has been ratified. These are the states that ratified it. It, it is duly to be uh, um, added to the Constitution. That's what we have to do with the Equal Rights Amendment. And with the Equal Rights Amendment, it's not going to solve all problems, but it gives us a very strong constitutional legal basis to challenge the abortion bans to get stronger laws on violence against women, to get stronger employment, uh, non-discrimination laws, and on and on. It becomes a basis for stronger legal action. Um, and so I, I wanna encourage everybody to always talk about the Equal Rights Amendment as having been ratified, uh, and we're gonna get it through. And that's another reason this next election is so critical. We have to have a majority in both houses that will support this resolution. And Kathy, where can people find that through Ms and click on that link really easily yes. <laughs> and read and distribute it. Well, that's great. And uh, actually, if you come to the website, it's mismagazine.com. Uh, we, at one of our trending categories is always the Equal Rights Amendment. And you can read everything there that we uh, have published recently. But if you want to participate too, there is a, uh, a petition that we want to get signed. Some 300 groups are helping circulate this petition. Uh, it's a very large coalition. It's signforera.org. So it's S-I-G-N, the number four, E-R-A dot org. And once you sign it, then, then we ask you to circulate it to your friends. We want to show that uh, it's right at almost 100,000 signatures. It's only the beginning. Uh, we really want to get that going so that when we get a good Congress, uh, which we will after this election, if everybody votes, um, we want to be able to get those resolutions uh, passed and finally added to the Constitution. So I think we're about out of time, and I, but I wanted to give um, the panelists any final words um, on the fight forward. So, I mean, the holidays are coming up, and some of you are into gift, gift giving. So this Ms. book <laughs> is a good gift to give not only the young woman or the young women in your lives, but also the men of all ages. They might look at you strangely or not, I don't know, but... <laughs> But please um, gift it and also talk about what is going on with the um, with the ERA and with voting, because this is going to go very quickly. We are going to be very quickly at this next major election. This is going to go very quickly after January 1st. And we need to be putting on the bootstraps and, and getting it together. Yeah. Thank you, Stephanie. Yeah. Um, you agree? Yeah, yes. Ditto, so ditto. ditto. So the and uh, voting. <laughs> And get young people out. Stacy. Yeah, the same. Um, we need to get um, students and younger people to understand what's at stake and what's going on. Yeah. So 
Thank all of you, Stacy, Stephanie, Beverly. Um, it's been a great thank couple you, of days to spend with thank you. you. And thank all of you very much. Uh, actually, this is almost the end. This is almost the end. Uh, there's, yes, yes, a little bit, a little bit. One more in New York, but this has been a wonderful, uh, and I have to tell you, it's been so great to be out and meeting people all over the country who are part of this great effort to for social justice and and um, equality it's it's been a, a real honor so thank all of you for coming tonight thank, thank you all for you. being here